Well, hello, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I am Edgar B. Herwick III from GBH's Curiosity Desk. Tonight, live from my living room here in Somerville, Massachusetts, I will be your guide for our virtual edition of Boston Talks. I'm really excited that you're with us. Our theme for the night is the 1920s and now. We've got two great speakers and we're gonna look back a little bit and learn about the 1920s and see if there might be something instructive for us as we uh, dive headlong into the 2020s. Very excited about it. I hope you're uh, excited too. I've uh, got myself a drink since I'm at home and not driving anywhere. Uh, feel free yourself to go grab one as well. When we used to do this event in person, we like to call it our smarter happy hour. So kick back, relax. Let's hope for an entertaining and uh, informative evening. Uh, and before we get really going, I wanna kick things over to my colleague, Jen, who's got a little bit of information for you about how it's all gonna work. Hi everybody, while we can't see you tonight, we do wanna hear from you. So when you have questions for uh, our speakers this evening, please open up the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type in your question there. When you do type in your question, be sure to let us know where you're tuning in from so we have an idea of how far we're reaching tonight with our discussion. And last but not least, if you see a question in there that you also wanna hear the answer to, please vote for it by clicking the thumbs up icon. We will do our best to get to as many questions as we possibly can tonight. Back to you, Edgar. Thank you, Jen. And that is really deadly serious, folks. We really do want to hear from you. One of the great things about doing this virtually while we can't gather in person is that we can hear from you. And I really like seeing those questions pop up in the Q&A. And as Jen said, I'm going to get to as many of them as I possibly can. Uh, so thank you in advance for participating. Uh, so uh, our two speakers tonight, Nicholas Christakis, who is a professor at Yale, and Kim Jenkins, who is a fashion scholar. Uh, we're going to look back at the 1920s and uh, maybe ahead to what else is coming for us here in the 2020s. And uh, without further ado, let's welcome Nicholas Christakis to your screen and mine. Nicholas is a professor at Yale. Nicholas, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Edgar. Uh, I'm really excited uh, to hear what you have to say. So we were talking earlier, Nicholas. And uh, you sort of said to me uh, that you think, you predict that there will be a quote unquote roaring 20s of the two, uh, of the, the 20, 20, 21st century. Basically that we have another roaring 2020s probably ahead of us. So maybe take us back to the roaring 20s in the 1920s and tell us what about that makes you think or say that we probably have one coming for us uh, now. Well, I'll let Kim Jenkins speak more to the 1920s, but just to frame what's likely to happen now, we are still, we are not many people maybe hoping, and I don't wish to break their bubble that, you know, because of the discovery of the vaccine, we're at the end of this pandemic. But unfortunately, that's not true. We're not at the beginning of the end. We're, we're just at the end of the beginning of the pandemic. Um, what's going to happen now over the coming year is that uh, we've invented a vaccine and we're the first generation of human beings alive who have been uh, fighting this ancient threat of plagues, which have been afflicting our species for thousands of years. We're the first generation alive that has been able to invent in real time a specific countermeasure, namely the vaccine, which is miraculous. But we still need to manufacture the vaccine, hundreds of millions of doses, distribute it, and persuade Americans to accept it uh, and it, we're gonna need to get to at least 50% of Americans vaccinated before we reach this important threshold known as herd immunity. Meanwhile, the, vaccine, the, the, the virus is still spreading. And so either way, I think it's gonna take about another year where we're gonna be living in a changed world uh, where we're gonna be wearing masks, we're gonna be physical distancing, we're gonna have intermittent business closures. The summer will be better, but we're still not gonna be through the woods in the summer. We're still gonna be vaccinating people in the fall Next winter, we're gonna have another wave. It will be much lower than this current wave, but there'll still be a bump. So I think we get to the end of 2021 where we'll have reached herd immunity either uh, artificially because we vaccinate at least half and the more the better people or naturally because the virus spreads and infects that many people. And then we will have put the biological and epidemiological impact of the virus behind us, okay? We'll have taken the wind out of its sails. The virus will still be there. It'll still kill people, but it won't have that epidemic potential of causing lots of deaths and outbreaks. But we're then gonna have to recover from the social and economic consequences of the virus. 
Millions of people have lost their jobs. Millions of businesses have gone out of business. Millions of children have lost school already. We've borrowed trillions of dollars against the future to, to cover the costs we've had now. Many millions of Americans, even if they don't die, will be disabled. We estimate that between half a million and a million Americans are going to die, which is appalling. Uh, just to be clear, one in 500 American adults have died already, but probably five times as many as die will be disabled, which is a large number of Americans. They'll need our attention. So if you look at centuries of plagues, it takes time for people to um, recover. So the intermediate period will last a couple of years till I think around approximately the beginning of 2024. And then I think we're gonna have a kind of a roaring 20s like we did a hundred years ago. So typically what happens during times of plague and I'm almost done, I'll shut up. Typically what happens during times of plague is that people become more religious, right? If you look at thousands of years of history, people become more risk averse and more abstemious. People uh, withdraw from social interaction, uh, avoid social contact. They did this during the bubonic plague in the 14th century. This is a typical response. They stop spending their money because there's nowhere to spend money on or they wanna save their money to recover in the future. But when, the, when we finally put this pandemic behind us, all of those trends will reverse. Religiosity having risen will now fall. People will relentlessly seek out social opportunities in nightclubs and bars and restaurants and sporting events and political rallies and musical concerts. We might see some sexual licentiousness. People will start spending their money liberally. We're gonna see, I think, an efflorescence of the arts and of entrepreneurship. I think in short that we'll have been cooped up for so long, constrained by the virus and by the economic shocks of the virus that finally we'll break free and we'll have a bit of a roaring 20s of the 21st century. So a couple of things. First of all, uh, Nicholas, just to remind you, you are here to talk. So we don't want you to shut up. So like, you well, know. no, but sometimes it's, <laughs> it's very difficult. Well, like, it's, the whole point trying, of this is that we want to hear what you have to say. Yeah, but if you tell a professor to talk, you know, then it's like, you just you know, go, right? yeah. so, you know, it's like, yeah, I used to go to night, uh, parties with my wife when I was a young man. And uh, people would say, what are you working on right now? I'd launch into a 30 minute conversation and Erica would kick me, you know, they don't want the long version. Just yeah, yeah, no, I totally understand. So, you know, one of the things that you just said in that, which was interesting is, is the idea that like uh, things that people have typically done in the past, you know, you, you sort of, you sort of talk about these sort of like centuries of plagues, like yes. past plagues. So actually, before we get further into that, talk to me about past plagues. And do we have, is it, is it that the 1918 flu influenced the the 1920s and that's kind of the plague yes, I think, for that era? Well, of course it was a first world war then, but you know, I think the roaring 20s of a hundred years ago was, was in part a reaction to the predations of the 1918 so-called Spanish influenza, yeah. uh, which was much deadlier. If you, if you, uh, if, if, but the important thing I think to learn from the history of epidemic disease in part is that this way we have come to live right now feels so alien and unnatural. Yeah. But, but plagues are not new to our species. They're just new to us. We think what's happening to us is an outrage and that it's crazy and it's appalling and we can't believe it. But really plagues you know, have been a feature of the human condition for thousands of years. They're in the Bible, they're in Shakespeare, they're in Homer, in the Iliad. The, the Iliad opens with a plague afflicting the Greeks that are laying siege to Troy. They're in, they're in Cervantes. My, my Jewish friends last spring said that for years they had said the Passover Seder and uh, hadn't really paid much attention to the part about the plague or it was sort of an abstract thing. Now all of a sudden people are like, oh my goodness, plague, right? Like plague, they're in the Psalms. I mean, there's, this is a part of the human condition. Now, serious plagues like this are rare. And if you look at the last century, respiratory pandemics come every 10 or 20 years. Yeah. In fact, there was one in 2009, and most listeners don't remember it, the H1N1 uh, influenza pandemic of 2009. The, the reason people don't remember it is that it was mild. It didn't kill many people. But there was one. Every 10 or 20 years, we get a respiratory pandemic. And every 50 or 100 years, we get a serious one. And this pandemic we're having right now is the second most serious pandemic we've had since 1918. The previous record holder was uh, the 1957 influenza pandemic and it was less than half as bad as the one we have now. So this is quite bad what we're experiencing. Yeah, I'm gonna to turn to the Q&A and, and just a reminder to those of you watching at home, 
please pop those questions into the Q&A. We've got one here, uh, Tom from Watertown, who asks, and I'm going to sort of broaden out his question, but I like this question, Tom. He says, uh, you're, spot, you, you, you're spot on with the effects of COVID, asking about how is the particular partisanship, the political part partisanship, going to affect our recovery with politicians who can't seem to agree on, any, on anything? Now, I want to broaden that and ask you, you know, you talk about things that we have seen through history, like people become more religious, they become a little bit more like abstentious during a plague. Do we have anything from history that instructs us about what happens politically? Like, is this typical of a plague that we, we have a kind of partisanship developing, or is this a little bit unique? So I'll talk about the partisanship in a moment, but let me back up just a moment to the other part of it, which is that, um, you know, plague was one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And, um, and if you think of plague as one of the four horsemen, you can think of lies and mendacity as its squire. Mm. It's time immemorial, whenever you have epidemic disease like this, you, you have denial and lies that are rife. So the germ spreads through social networks from person to person, and right behind it follow lies. And we have seen this in the 21st century plague as well, in our society, in the highest levels of our government, we've seen outright lies about what's happening. Oh, this is no worse than the flu. Oh, hydroxychloroquine will be a, a miracle drug. Uh, nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. Nothing is going to happen. These are these were lies, uh, and we now know that the that the former president was aware of the reality of the condition, but chose to lie about it. Now, in part, political leaders do this because the public wants to hear lies. Right? Nobody wants to hear really bad news that a deadly germ is afflicting our society, and as many as a million Americans were going to die from this condition half a million, 460 or 470,000 that of known deaths have occurred so far, probably 20% more than that are the cumulative to total a burden of the disease. It is a, it's a catastrophe that has afflicted our society. Now, and, and there's a little feature there, which is that many people are still unaffected and they, they, they can't quite put the two and two together. They hear what I'm saying and they're like, yes, my life is constrained, but it's not so bad, I'm okay. And it's generally true, the majority of Americans, as I, this is the good news, is that plagues always end, and we are going to see the other side of this condition. But it is also true, unfortunately, that this plague is bad. But let me say one other thing, and then I'll come back to the partisanship. So, you know, it's, it, it is, um, how to put this exactly? It is, it is, um, there's no God-given reason that this germ, bad as it is, isn't worse. So this pathogen kills about 1% of the people that it infects and that it causes symptoms in. Between 0.5 and 0.8% of people who get it overall will die. And if you get symptoms from it, you have to double that approximately. Let's say about 1% of people who get symptomatic COVID will go on to die. It varies by age, of course. And that's actually quite bad as a pathogen, but it could have been so much worse. Yeah. It could have killed 10% or 30%. We could have been facing a bubonic plague type situation in the 21st century in the United States. And unlike cholera and bubonic plague, which are bacteria and for which we have effective antibiotics, we have very few effective treatments for viruses. So a virus that kills 10 or 30% of the people and that was spreading as much as this virus, our society would have been facing a kind of annihilation actually. So yeah. we are lucky, we are lucky that it only kills 1% of people. But even that lucky only 1% is actually very bad. If you're an infectious disease doctor, you don't think 1% death rate is benign. So, so it's a serious condition. It happens rarely, once every 100 years, these types of plagues. But it's been happening for thousands of years. This type of calamity has been afflicting people. Let's not forget when the European settlers settled the, the New World, they brought with them diseases that wiped out the Native American population. 95% of the population died within 70 years, 75 years, just wiped out. So the politicization is very, it's not the politicization, the, the, the desire for denial is, is, is very human and very typical. The politicization is not so typical. It is the case that in the 1918 pandemic, things like mask wearing were also politicized. But not every society in the world politicized the pandemic. Many societies had pragmatic, apolitical responses. And our country, unfortunately, collapsed in this regard. 
Mostly I would lay the blame at the White House, but there were many Democratic politicians as well, Democrat politicians as well, who, um, who also dropped the ball. And, uh, and I think it, it is really an, unfor an unfortunate reality that this is, this is what happened, that this is what we did. So uh, speaking of what we did uh, during uh, this period, the, the last year, while we've been dealing with this modern plague, as you, as you put out there, uh, you, of all things, you wrote a book, right? You were just like, oh, OK, I'm, what led to this? You, you, what, you had a little extra time on your hands, and you said, I should just go ahead and quickly write a book. Well, what happened in my case, yeah, I wrote the Apollo Zero. Um, what happened is I, I had been working with some Chinese scientists for years doing a bunch of research projects on human social networks. And, um, and I, uh, sometime in the middle of January, we started corresponding. We were using phone data to study human social interactions in China in various kinds of ways. And I had been aware of what was happening with the pandemic in, you know, by news reports in, in January, and, but I wasn't paying too much attention. And I started working with my Chinese co-authors on some projects looking at the mobility of people through Wuhan in China as they spread out throughout China and tracking what was happening with the virus. And as a result of this, I started paying more attention to China. And I became aware of the fact that on January 24th and 25th, the Chinese government promulgated regulations that required 930 million people to stay at home. The Chinese saw in the virus a sufficient threat that they basically detonated a social nuclear weapon to stop it. And that really got my attention. I'm like, a billion people on the other side of the planet are locked up at home right now. And is there any reason I could think of that we would be unaffected? And the more I thought about it, I. It was, it was obvious to any expert that the virus had spread well outside of China by then. I couldn't come to any, couldn't console myself. And then in uh, February, as people may remember, Italy collapsed, Northern Italy. So we had a rich European democracy that's being decimated. And so I'm like, oh my goodness, this is gonna happen to the United States. But our political leaders weren't saying anything. And, on, uh, and by March the 5th, uh, Yale, where I teach had, uh, had gone on spring break, I had gone home, I was at home, still things were relatively peaceful, but the Americans were not so concerned. And I was like, I, I need to do something to try to help people to understand what's gonna happen. So I started sending out these Twitter threads about like epidemiology 101, you know, pandemic disease 101. Yeah. And a lot of those threads started going viral. And that gave me the idea of writing a book about the topic. And since I was locked down anyway, and since this is something I've been thinking about one way or the other for 20 years, I just uh, you know, wrote the book and I delivered it to the editor on July the, four months later, July the 15th. Uh, I started March the 15th, I finished July the 15th and then you know, went through editing and publishing and it came out in October. So the title, as you uh, alluded to, uh, is Apollo's Arrow, subtitled The Profound and Enduring Impact of Coronavirus on the Way We Live. But what, what is the Apollo's Arrow about? Oh my God, that is a riveting story. You know, I grew up on Greek mythology. So what happens is that the Greeks are laying siege to Troy in, in the Iliad. And uh, this is the beginning story in the Iliad. This is how the Iliad begins. And as part of their siege, they, the Greeks were sacking vassal states of Troy. So they'd go on these expeditions to nearby kingdoms and sack them. They'd kill all the men, they'd, they'd uh, loot all the treasure and they'd enslave all the women and bring them back to the Greek camp. These were the Greeks, okay? But anyway, that's just what they were doing. And uh, they, they, uh, Agamemnon, the king of the Greeks, had taken as his prize a maiden girl by the name of Chryseis and also a bunch of other treasure. Anyway, he's the king of all the Greeks, the leading king. And, uh, and, and Chryseis' father, who was a priest of Apollo in this sacked city, comes to ransom his daughter. And he brings a great treasure to the Greek encampment. And he goes to Agamemnon's tent and he says, I'm here to ransom my daughter, please set her free. And Agamemnon not only refuses, but he treats the man very rudely in front of the army. He smacks the man. He says, not only will I not release your daughter, she's gonna grow old in my house, working at my loom, in my bed. And the Greek, the, the Greek soldiers think this is very bad karma to you know, abuse the priest in this fashion, which it proved was true, it was bad karma because the priest goes down to the beach and he prays to Apollo and he says, if you have ever, if I've ever sacrificed anything to you of value, please hear me now and punish the Greeks. And Apollo up on Olympus is enraged by this. 
And many ancient religions saw the God of healing and the God of disease as the same God. Apollo was the God of healing and the God of disease and many other things. And so Apollo hears this and he puts his great silver bow on and he flies from Olympus down onto the Greek encampment through the sky. And, um, and many ancient religions, including the ancient Greeks, thought of, of, a vir of um, plagues or of, or of disease as an invisible arrow that the gods you know, from on high would, would, would kill you with. And so Apollo then, the, the, the Homer says, crouched among the ships and unleashed this barrage of arrows. First, he killed the running dogs, then the horses, then the men. Nine days through the army went the arrows of the god until the 10th day, Hera, the queen of the gods, uh, took pity on the Greeks for she saw them perishing. And that then Hera comes and whispers in Achilles' ear and that sets into motion the play. Anyway, the point is that one of the canonical uh, pieces of literature of, our, of Western civilization begins with a plague. Plagues are not new to our species, they're just new to us. I'm gonna to turn to the Q&A. We've got a bunch in here, so I'm gonna to try to get to some of these, uh, as many as we can here with you, Nicholas. Uh, we've got one from David who asks, uh, he says, from what he's read about the Spanish flu, society quickly forgot about it and life went on, maybe evidenced by the roaring 20s on the heels of it. Do you see that happening here too? Yes, I think you forget about it, it forgets about it in a certain way. There's something about threats that occur more than three generations ago that is beyond our lived experience that people forget in a particular way. But we also don't fully forget. This is why we put plagues in the Bible and, and in, in, um, in, um, uh, in other kinds of oral traditions to transmit this knowledge to descendants who, who would re-encounter this threat at the end of living memory. And so it is true that the person on the street forgot but it is not true that it was all forgotten. Epidemiologists did not forget. Historians did not forget. Knowledge about epidemics of this kind was not lost to us. And, and so, in fact, that is one of the hallmarks of our species is that we can, can assemble and transmit knowledge across time and space. And across time, because we have the history, the historical knowledge, and across space, one of the interesting things is the ways in which scientists have, and other people, this is a long story, it's discussed in the book, so I'm speaking very fast right now. But one of the ways we humans have to respond to plagues is precisely through this transmission of knowledge across time by knowing the history and across space, like right now where sh scientists around the world are sharing knowledge, which has resulted in the invention of the vaccine, yeah. which is how we're gonna actually beat the virus. Yeah, so speaking of beating the virus, we have a number of questions here, which kind of all relate to the same thing. We've got Bill asking about, the, the 1918 flu, and if it died out just over a two-year period. Uh, we've, we've 1918 flu, that pathogen is still with us. It still circulates. It just doesn't kill us anymore. Yeah, it's, okay. So that, that so, actual virus, the 1918 virus, and the COVID, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is going to become so-called endemic. It's never going to leave our species. It's going to be with us forever. In the long time period, it will mutate. It, well, it is mutating all the time, but the variants that are relatively more benign will come to predominate over decades. And ultimately, this virus, I think, its fate will be to be like other coronaviruses that just cause the common cold. Anyway, I'm sorry, Edgar, proceed. No, that was good. There, there, was a, there were a number of questions there. So thanks to everybody who sort of asked around that. You, you actually addressed a bunch of them. We got a question here from, uh, from crew staff, uh, which I'll sort of ask broadly. And I, I actually wonder if there's anything in history uh, that will, will help us with this. They're asking about K through 12 students in particular. I think maybe let's look at that in part because of what's happened with schools. But what about like, I mean, is there anything that we know from history about what, how these things impact young people in particular? Well, children are very much, first of all, most respiratory pandemics have a U-shaped mortality curve. They kill the very young and the yeah. very old. And, yeah. and, and COVID-19 is unusual in that it spares the young across the board, relatively speaking. Um, and, and furthermore, uh, American or children around the world are suffering mightily from the pandemic because their schools are closed, their parents have lost work. There is going to be quite a lot of trauma in our society amongst this generation of young people, a second point. However, uh, in a kind of macro way, what's likely to happen in this situation is, is that this disease is going to become like other diseases. Like, for example, if many of the listeners will be familiar with chickenpox. They know that if you get chickenpox as a kid, 
yes, it's itchy and it's painful, but it's not a big deal. If you've never been exposed to chicken pox, but then once you get it as a kid, you're immune for life, roughly speaking. Yeah. Uh, but if you've never been exposed to chicken pox and get it for the first time as an adult, you can die from it. So I think this condition is gonna be like that, and many other people do too, that because we know it's relatively benign in kids, eventually what's gonna happen is this is gonna be the kind of condition you get ex exposed to as a child, you have a mild illness, and then you have some significant immunity. And then if you're re-exposed as an adult, you just get a common cold, you don't get a serious disease once it settles out. That is a likely outcome of this. And that, and that exposure in children will not be such a big deal. Right now, however, it's different because we're at the beginning of the pandemic and children can in fact be vectors of this pathogen. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question from Pamela Reynolds. Uh, I like this question a lot. Uh, she, she sort of mentions 1920s and one of the things that characterizes it is prohibition here in the US. So the question is, was that connected at all to the 1918 pandemic or you, you know, plague? And do, do we expect that there may be, you know, we've had relaxing marijuana laws and stuff here. Is, is that a typical reaction? Like, does that have anything I, I, to do with it? I'm not a historian. Take our ability to smoke marijuana away from us. Yeah, yes, I'm not. I'm not a historian of the 20th century. Kim Jenkins may, may be better at answering that particular question. I don't know, but um, uh, but I what I will say is on the not on the uh, the liberalization or on unliberalization of uh, substance laws, substance use laws. What I will comment on is a little bit about, let's not forget what happened after the, after the 1920s is we had the Great Depression and the yeah. crash. Yeah. And um, we may also see something like that in, I mean, you know, history is, doesn't exactly replay itself, but let's not forget we are borrowing trillions of dollars right now against the future. We're printing money. And um, most economists will tell you that in this type of situation, eventually you're gonna have inflation. Um, now, when that inflation comes, there's a lot of stuff we could talk about. We don't have time, the, the economics of all of this, but, but it's possible that after this kind of exuberant booming phase uh, in the 19, in the 2024 or so for a period of time, you know, eventually we'll have to pay the piper and um, we could have other problems in the, in the long-term future. If we don't manage the situation exceptionally well. All right. Well, uh, before I let you go, I, I'll say this: we're we're you know we're all sort of approaching you know about a year into this, and as you suggest, uh, this is you know for I think a lot of people, um, it, this is a, a, you know novel to us, but as you say, not novel to humans. So what to, what you know give us a give us a little something to put in our pocket, a little piece of advice. Yeah, I'm going to read. To keep in mind uh, in the dark days of winter, in the yes. midst of the plague. Help so us I, read. I, I knew you would ask something like this. So I prepared a short thing I want to read from Albert Camus' book, The Plague. Camus is an existential philosopher. He sort of believes in absurdism. He writes this in 1947, and it's set in the North African village of Oran. And it, it's, 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 it's set in the 1940s, but it's actually kind of more evocative of what was happening in Europe in the prior century, like with bubonic plague outbreaks. And the protagonist is a doctor, a physician called Dr. Rieu. And here is, here is what Camus writes. He writes, Dr. Rieu resolved to compile this chronicle so that some memorial of the injustice and outrage done them might endure and to state quite simply what we learn in time of pestilence, that there are more things to admire in men than to despise. And that's how I feel. I know we're gonna see the other side of this, I'm very impressed with many good qualities in our society that have equipped us to respond to this ancient threat, even though I recognize some of the difficulties as well. Nicholas Christakis, professor at Yale University, thank you for taking the time. Everybody out there, we'll have a link to his book in an email that you will get later tonight. So uh, get out there and buy that book. He, he, he worked hard to write that during this during this crazy time. Nicholas, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much, Edgar. All right, we've got uh, our second speaker, Kim Jenkins, coming up in a minute. We're gonna do a little trivia before that. And before that, I'm gonna kick things over to my colleague, Sandy Chin. This is a, a production of a, uh, of a public media company. And uh, you, might, uh, you might know what be, what's uh, coming up here. Sandy, uh, what do you got for us?
Thank you, Edgar. And thanks for spending some time with us this evening while Boston talks about the 1920s and the 2020s. Viewers and listeners turn to GBH for many reasons, whether it's to learn something new about history and news or to simply be entertained for a while. And if you feel GBH is worth listening to, worth watching and supporting, then please make a donation. Today, when you show your support by making a one-time donation of $60 or by giving $5 each month as a sustaining member, we'll say thanks by sending you this BPR ice scraper. It even has a mitten to keep your hand warm as you clear snow and ice from your windshield. Visit gbh.org slash support events to make a donation in any amount. Every dollar our donors give enables GBH to continue producing great virtual events like this one year round. Simply click on that link in the chat tab now to open up a secure page and contribute what you can. We appreciate you being here with us tonight and thanks in advance for your support. And if you are already a member, thank you for all you do to help GBH's ongoing efforts to develop new and better ways to reach and engage our audiences and you at home. And now back to you, Edgar. Thank you, Sandy. And as Sandy said, it's uh, how it's worked in public broadcasting for a very long time. We can't do what we do without your support. So thank you in advance for that. We really appreciate it. Okay, a little bit of a tradition with our Boston Talks, both when we used to do these in person and since we've been doing them virtually, and that is a little bit of trivia. We're gonna do this quickly because I really wanna have some time to, to spend speaking with Kim Jenkins. Uh, and don't forget, we're gonna wanna hear from you in that Q&A once Kim gets to the screen as well. But for now, if you wanna participate, please participate. Uh, go ahead and vote. We're gonna look at the 1920s uh, for these trivia questions. Uh, and first one, uh, how many states? Were there here in the United States in the 1920s? Would it have been 44, 46, 48, or 50? How many states comprised the United States through the 1920s? Get that vote in there. Let's see uh, what you have to say, folks. Let's bring up the answer. I think you've probably had enough time to pop it in there. What did we do? But ding we've got. 56%, more than half of you saying that there were 48 states in the 1920s, and you are absolutely correct. That is absolutely correct. Yes, New Mexico and Arizona were added in 1912, bringing us up to 48, and we were there all the way till 1959 when Alaska and Hawaii became the 49th and 50th state. All right, question number two, bring it up. So. We uh, have the Pulitzer Prize, and the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction was awarded nine times in the 1920s. There was no prize in 1920, so nine times the prize was awarded in the 1920s. Your question, how many of those prizes were won by women? Pulitzer Prize for Fiction was given out nine times through the 1920s, once every year from 21 to 29. How many of them were won by women writers? So pop your uh, last chance there, pop an answer in there. Zero, one, three, or five, drum roll. So 30% of you say zero, 56% more than half again say one, 13% say three, and only 1% of you, three people thought it was five. Well, the minority wins here. In fact, it was five women in the 1920s winning the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. Edith Wharton for Age of Innocence, Willa Cather for One of Ours, Margaret Wilson for The Abel McLaughlins, Edna Ferber for So Big, and Julia Peterkin, Peterkin for Scarlet Sister Mary. Five women writers winning the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction through the 1920s. Last question before we get on to our final speaker of the night. This is a Boston question. So which Boston sports team which Boston sports franchise played their first game in the 1920s? Would it be the Red Sox, the Bruins, the Celtics, or the Patriots? Which famed Boston team? And to be fair, the Patriots are a New England team, but which famed Boston franchise played their first game in the 1920s? The Red Sox, the Bruins, the Celtics, or the Patriots? Get those votes in and let's get the drum roll and the answer. What did we think? Most people say it was the Boston Red Sox with 38% of you going with the Red Sox. And in fact, no, that is not true. It was the Boston Bruins, only 33% of you right there. The Red Sox started back in 1901, 
uh, the Celtics not till 1946 and the Patriots not until 1960. But those Boston Bruins joined uh, the National Hockey League in 1924 and played their first match. So thank you for participating in trivia. Well done, everybody out there. Really appreciate it. And uh, we're going to continue on with our second and final speaker of the night. And welcome to my screen and yours, Kim Jenkins, who is a fashion scholar, which sounds like a really amazing job. Uh, Kim, thanks for joining us. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you. It's great to be here. It's great to have you. Uh, so, uh, you know, maybe for starters, uh, you know, as we said, our theme is sort of looking back at the 1920s and looking for parallels between the 1920s and the 2020s. Uh, and, you know, fashion is obviously something that I think, you know, even, even to a casual observer, I think people kind of understand sort of that at least we perceive that fashion was an important sort of part of the 1920s. Uh, I want to start and ask, is that true? Like, was, did, did, was fashion sort of more important in the 20s than it maybe was in the teens or would be in the 30s? Or is it just kind of like, it's just a decade? And In know, our perception or I, in, I, I, during that time? No, I think, I, I mean, I think in our perception, people are like, the 1920s, fashion was so important. And I'm asking, is that true? Or any more so than, you know, any more so than the, ten, the you know, 1910s or the 1930s? Or is there something special about the 20s as we perceive it? I don't know about the 1920s specifically being, uh, so it, it's interesting. Um, in the 19 teens and then leading into the 1920s, we also had, um, and, and this is where in my field of fashion studies, we look at it from this interdisciplinary angle where you have to think about literature and art and music and film and all of that going into it, it, it like many historians do. And um, there was a great deal of intellectualism, expansion, you know, exploring other cultures that were happening at that time. So with that, you also saw, I mean, there was a great deal of ornamentation happening where there were these elaborate outfits, designers like Paul Poiré, French designer who was very popular, um, who was doing these sort of feathers and just very outlandish kind of outfits. But then there was also this kind of desire or appetite for intellectualism. It was this, uh, by the 1930s, you'd see this neoclassical moment happening. People, women really wanting to be taken seriously and, um, and just sort of wanting to draw less attention to their bodies, wanting to be seen less as um, not trying to align themselves with this idea that women are, need to deal with just ornamentation. Um, they wanted to be taken seriously like men. So scaling back into the 19 teens, um, you had these moments already coming up, um, these liter literary movements, artistic movements, social movements in the 19 teens that women were engaged in. I mean, women's suffrage happened by 1920 in the US. And so women really wanted to be taken seriously. So the style that you start seeing um, by the 1920s, um, really I would say is a peak. Everyone just thinks of 1920s as flappers as if it just happened out of nowhere, you know, just all yeah, of a like, sudden everyone they, has like, this. Like when the clock struck midnight on January 1st, 1920, <laughs> everybody was like, I want to wear a flapper dress. Everyone was. So like, it, it was really dress. just a lot of experimentation happening. Um, women cutting off their hair, um, you know, and you know, and so also when it comes to the silhouette, you see this very kind of tubular look, uh, yeah. which is, I guess, iconic for the flapper look, which women were actually doing in the 19 teens, the women who were kind of the originators of this look. So again, I just want to emphasize it was this emphasis on not trying to draw attention to the body. And so for anyone who isn't um, looped into, you know, fashion history uh, and the timeline that we know, um, before that, this was a reaction. Um, before that, you had in the early 1900s or the turn of the 20th century, this S-curve silhouette, you know, and this is very curvy, um, kind of voluptuous look. And, um, you know, so by the time you have the 19 teens and then the 1920s, women were wanting to distance themselves from that. Where in the early 1900s, it was all about long hair everywhere and piled up on top of your head. By the 1920s, even 19, late 19 teens, cut it off, let's get a bob or an Eden crop um, popularized by Josephine Baker. You know, if everything is about an S-curve silhouette and corseting, I wanna do 
just padding and then just this very tubular kind of almost masculine kind of shaped body. So um, kind of a distancing from fashion with a capital F of not being so much like this delicate flower. Um, you definitely saw women wanting to lean into that and men also wanting to experiment with gender um, you know, fluidity really, and just kind of exploring what they could do with their dress. Um, so yeah, it's very fascinating. Interesting. Uh, I'm going to turn to the Q&A and try to get to some of those before I ask some more questions that I am dying to ask. But uh, we've got uh, Brew Miller, uh, who's asking uh, whether uh, internationalism or an international movement, international fashion, uh, uh, international influence on fashion, is that a consequence of World War I, soldiers spending time abroad? Is, uh, do you have a sense of that? Or do we know if, if it's particularly like internationally facing? I mean, it could be some of that, yes. But um, there's also, um, the, the exact date is escaping me, but um, the exhuming of King Tut's cave. Um, mm. So, so it's, it's war, yes. It's travel, increased travel. It's discoveries that all of a sudden break into the news. So um, from a... Um, Hollywood perspective or early cinema and something you would see in the fashion gazettes if you're living at that time, you would see women um, taking on these, um, what they fantasize as the Egyptian look, um, doing the eye makeup and wearing head adornments and things like that, um, almost to the point of parody for that. Um, but it, it was various things. Um, also, uh, there's this fantastic book I refer to a great deal with my students um, called Negrophilia um, from about 15 or so years ago. And it, it talks about um, this fantasy and obsession with black culture in the 1920s in Paris. It was a signal that you were part of the avant-garde and you were in the cool crowd to be sort of really interested in all things coming from Africa. The unfortunate thing is they just kind of collapsed blackness um, from the arts, the music, everything into just one lump identity. Um, but Josephine Baker, you know, expats like Josephine Baker went over there and just milked it. I mean, she just really played into some of those fantasies and laughed all the way to the bank. So it was, to answer that question, it was various cultures going in there, you know, expats from the US coming over into Paris and them wanting to um, get into quote unquote African styles that are wearing, um, these bangle bracelets and anything that they think comes out of Africa is cool. And they start listening to the new jazz music. So it, yeah, um, we just see it kind of all floating together. You know, in, in, in that time, is it, you know, you talk about like, you know, Paris or you talk about France, like sort of adopting this. Were, were we at a point even then, like we think of now where like places like, you know, Paris, is like a fashion capital that then gets sort of imported back here uh, to the U.S. or what? Or did it sort of work differently then? Uh, uh, yeah, in the early 1900s, um, Paris was king. Um, mm -hmm. The the early fashion district and really the, the the kind of fashion capital we had was in New York, and um, it really wasn't until 1930s, 1940s we start seeing fashion designers coming out. We haven't even conceptualized something like that yet in New York City. Um, so up until then, New York City and the, and the early garment districts was purely made for just churning out clothes, just garments. It wasn't seen as something fashionable. And so um, for quite a while, uh, for the first few decades, um, business people, women, socialites, everyone got their looks and their ideas from Paris. And there were people hired to be um, sort of people who uh, copyists who um, if you know if you didn't have your hands on a camera, you could take a, an illustration book and run over to Paris and just quickly um, scribble down all of the looks that you're seeing coming down the runway um, during that time. You take it back to New York and they copy it. So, um, New, so New York and the US didn't really have much of a style identity up until then, um, but you had a group of people by the 1930s really tired of that and saying, we're tired of being in the shadow of Paris and we want to create our own smart American look that's all our own uh, and we can do the same thing they're doing. Mm. Yeah. So let's let's talk about today does 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 how 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 does you know any of this from the 1920s relate to today inform today or does it not? Oh gosh it it, it is hard to make that distinction but you know um 
when I was thinking about what we would talk about tonight, I was trying to make some connections. I mean, gosh, I mean, one connection, and this is loose, um, was that I started thinking about the 19 teens and women who were very interested in um, not, again, as I was saying, not being sort of these delicate flowers or, or um, <clears throat> having to have their bodies literally shaped by corsets and, and um, living the way their mothers did. Um, and so they were breaking out of these things, playing with gender norms, um, wanting to wear things that drew less attention to their body, doing more adventurous things with their look. And that's not too unlike what I started seeing by the, by the 2010s. I mean, we've, we've seen this happen in you know, the 60s, all the, the swinging 60s and um, various eras in 1970s. Um, but you also could say you see this kind of bubbling up in the 2010s. For me as a professor working with students, it was by that time I start hearing students saying, um, talking about pronouns and how they want to be identified. And, and some of my students um, wanted, uh, the young women who are my students were wanting to do more adventurous things with their look. And, um, you know, um, they were inspired by kind of new feminist leanings and uh, the Me Too movement. And so all of that bubbling up kind of spilling over into how they're dressing today. And um, they're not as interested in um, having these kind of styles or looks, you know, gender-based styles or looks prescribed to them. So I do see some similarities there where it's almost like this new era of flappers, just doing what they want and yeah. Um, yeah. You know, uh, you have this uh, project, the, the Fashion and Race Database. Mm -hmm. uh, let's start with you explaining a little bit about what this is. So when I was teaching at Parsons School of Design, I was teaching at Parsons School of Design at the new school and Pratt Institute for seven years. And um, by, I started teaching there at both of those schools in 2013. And by 2016, I had been teaching fashion history and I thought, you know, I really wanna find more resources that examine or explore the intersections of race, racism, the uncomfortable conversations, more diverse fashion histories. Um, and I wasn't admittedly finding all of the resources I needed at my fingertips at my school. And so if you don't see it, you build it. And so I started just combing through the libraries and gathering books from critical race studies, cultural studies, women's studies, African-American studies, um, you name it, ethnic studies, anthropology. Uh, and I started gathering all these things and compiling them and finding everything that they said on, fas on fashion and race, um, anything that was talking about adornment or dress. And so I started collecting it and it started as this kind of humble website back in 2017. And I was just collecting books, articles, exhibitions, podcast episodes related to this. I started getting phone calls and emails around the world with people saying, I'm working on a dissertation in London or a thesis in Tokyo wow. and your website saved me. You know, I was like, I knew that there was something to this, you know, they'd say, and, but I, you know, I was hunting all over the place and you made a website that just put it all together into this one cohesive um, platform. And so in creating that space um, last year, I decided to re completely revamp it and make it more of a robust online library. And um, so the new Fashion and Race database, if you go to fashionandrace.org, it's completely different now. And it really does seem like an online library and it's anything you could ever want to know or explore about the intersections of fashion and the social construct of race and the implications of it. There's countless books on colonialism and the impact of it on dress, you know, how echoing what Nicholas said, um, as a fashion historian, I talked to my students about a couple centuries back, how, you know, the British would come in or the Americans would come in and impose these certain dress styles on groups of people and how, um, you know, in the centuries that would come and all the way up to today, um, dress is definitely a signal of modernity or if, you know, of um, it qualifies your citizenship, whether you like it or not. It shows that you can assimilate. Um, so we explore all those things on the Fashion Race database. And what's been exciting is now I've gotten the ear of the fashion industry because um, some people, whether you're into fashion or not, many of you who look at the news, you may have seen over the last few years, 
that fashion brands have been taken to task for quote unquote racist missteps, um, de- you know, going into cultural misappropriation um, simply because they don't know enough about um, the, the actual context of a garment or an object. And then it turns out it had sacred significance or, yeah. you know, just something very kind of tender about it. And, you know, here they are trotting it down a runway. So um, I started uh, my first opportunity to kind of educate and work with a brand was with Gucci in 2019. They hired me as an educator for them. And then um, today, um, Tommy Hilfiger announced that they're going to work with me long term um, for the database and they see it as a resource for them. So when you say today, do you mean like today? Like, yes, this the day? press release came out today. <laughs> That's amazing. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's exciting because all my fashion nerd friends are just cheering because, you know, I you know, it's like the NBA championships or something for us. It's, you know, for people in academia in this one world to reach over and create this bridge over to the industry where the fashion industry listens to you and says, you know what, you know, maybe this professor could be useful for the work we're doing. And maybe this database platform could be useful. So speaking of this, I'm going to turn to the Q&A. We've got a question from uh, Zara. Uh, she says, uh, first of all, she says this is fascinating, so well done. Um, but, uh, she, you know, she's sort of uh, talking, asking you to talk a little bit more about when you were talking about this sort of like when, you know, in France where you had this kind of uh, interest for better or worse in, in Black culture in the 1920s. Uh, and, and she's asking about expounding on parallels to the current society's relationship with Black culture. Yeah, actually, you know, I wasn't going to jump into it when you first asked the question. And so I was talking about kind of women and liberation and that connection, but I was thinking, you know what, there's another connection yeah, I could make. Yeah. And as I was building um, and developing my fashion and race course, I would find these readings that were kind of buried down in fashion history or art history that were talking about these egregious things of just, um, for instance, Um, in the 1920s, the popularity of the word slave, um, used very loosely to just say that, you you know, I'm a slave to fashion, things like that, throwing words like that around. But also, in the material sense, there was a popularity for slave collars, which actually, the actual collars were used back in chattel slavery, which is the most brutal form of slavery in the U.S. and and other regions. Um, And it was used as a fashion statement. It made a comeback. Um, And you would see it in a magazine. There's a a Vogue, a picture of a um, Vogue cover from the 1920s that I'd show my students of an illustration of a woman with a fashionable slave collar. And you would see this. I also had an image of an actress from the 1950s who had one. Also, there were slave bracelets that were, uh, or slave cuffs that were popular too. Blackamores, um, which are pervasive in the decorative arts and luxury, you'd see blackamores um, as figurines, statues, coffee tables, also these brooches, which is just this black face. Um, not like black face, but uh, like a gollywog image, but it's more of this kind of very stylized, Europeanized um, luxury brooch. It's usually filled with emeralds or diamonds and things like that. Um, and so, yeah, you would see those things happening. And so those are some uh, examples of kind of these racist fashionable items during that time. But also, yeah, and Zara, um, you would see, um, I, I can't recommend enough Patrine Archer Straw's book, Negrophilia. Um, I used it from undergrad, and then when I was a grad student, and then I started teaching it uh, as a professor. Um, and it talks about the 1920s and, and this word, Negrophilia, this fascination with African culture. And there were these men in France um, who were called Negrophiles. They took such pride in it. And there's these pictures of their homes where they're just kind of lounging and they've got masks everywhere. They, all of these things that they've collected from Africa. And um, it became you know, just very domineering. It was very much like, I know your culture and I collect your things. And, and they, these Negrophiles were these purists about black culture, these white men. And they would um, talk about what the right kind of African mask is and, oh, that's not a good one. You know, so just really nitpicking yeah. and deciding to curate and decide what good design in Africa is and what, you know, and the kinds of sculptures. And so Pablo Picasso was very much interested in all of this and this informed his cubism. 
various artists would do, uh, were interested in this, but also you had some snobbery happening uh, to where you, they saw, you know, for some people in France, their friends who were into jazz or African styles or design or sculptures, that was very primitive and vulgar. And so you'd have these purists out there, these writers or philosophers saying, please, you know, um, let's get back to good art and good design and uh, enough with that kind of um, dark Africa stuff. So, um, but it, it was definitely this movement and it was really the fit, the, the flames were fanned by uh, American expats coming over, black jazz musicians, a writer Langston Hughes and Josephine Baker again, coming over to kind of show what was possible with this style. Um, so yeah, it's really fascinating stuff. Kim Jenkins, uh, we don't have a ton of time left, so I want to spend a little time talking about looking ahead. Uh, you know, there's a lot of questions here um, about the effect of the pandemic on fashion, both from a sort of from a like a business standpoint is going to change the way the industry operates, but also from a what we're wearing standpoint, whether that be PPE or jogging pants and stuff. So uh, maybe just what are your thoughts on where we're at now with fashion and how the pandemic is, is impacting it and what we might expect looking ahead? Well, several thoughts before the pandemic even happened. Um, there was also this second wave I guess it would be a second wave of streetwear becoming popular um, to where um, you had streetwear that was being popularized within the black community, then crossing over um, up to even 10 years ago into high fashion. So you had luxury brands suddenly making sneakers for six to $800 and really wanting to be into this, you know, cool, casual, but, you know, upscale look. And so you would, you're wondering, why am I buying joggers or sweatpants for $200 for men? You know, you have men who are doing this. And um, I mean, we could go on and on of like how we got here. But, you know, I, one thing I, I would quickly like to insert, though, is kind of um, how casual the increased casualness of labor, of work um, that we've seen, you know, from Silicon Valley to uh, people, you know, working at WeWork, places like that, where you don't necessarily need to dress up anymore. Young men saying, I don't need to wear a suit and tie unless you're working around Wall Street or in you know, certain fields, not feeling this need to dress up. So that carved out a space for street wear and more casual wear, same with women um, wanting to wear that. So that's one thing. Um, now we don't really have to make too much of a pivot from that because people are already kind of there with wearing kind of casual sweats, but you know, make it luxury or things like that. Um, and, you know, and just casual clothes. Um, we also see um, brands hit, um, of course, by the pandemic. Um, and you know, the phenomenon or what we're seeing isn't too different from um, an interesting thing uh, I was hearing back when the pandemic first started um, with, with experts speaking about this, universities, how um, there was this expert speaking about universities and what's gonna happen with them and how um, you're probably gonna have these kind of Ivy Leagues or the, the top you know, universities, they'll be okay. And then community colleges, you know, people will go towards those. And then the middle, you know, you've heard various people from economics and just saying about this middle just falling out. Um, the same is kind of happening in fashion, I believe, um, where you're always going to have Gucci. Everyone knows what Gucci is. They trust Gucci. They don't mind spending that much money on Gucci or Chanel or any of these brands. And then they also love to buy things off of Amazon and just get it cheap. But now it's these department stores or these middle brands maybe that have kind of lost their identity or people don't really know if they want to shop with them anymore, they may be falling out, which is why we're seeing a lot of these department stores falling by the wayside. So people are going just for the super cheap and easy or the brands they trust. And it doesn't always have to be luxury, but the brands that are just too big almost to fail of just, we've now invested so much cultural, you know, the uh, capital into that. So yeah. Um, so yeah, I see that happening. And then one last thing uh, with what could happen um, is, uh, and this is also kind of um, dovetailing with what Nicholas said earlier, um, I think, I'm someone who loves to dress up anyway, um, but um, I think you're always going to have people who just like to dress up no matter what. But um, I do think there could be, you know, this awful overcompensation with the style. This, the pendulum this, over swinging. Yeah. You know, there's yeah, a person in the you, QA that was asking that. Do you think there's going to be? Yes, absolutely. The, yeah. the euphoria, just like after World War II of just sort of like, 
people just wanting to go into opulence and just, you know, um, wanting to wear things, even if it's impractical, you know, and just really yeah. just wanting to be out there. But the caveat is just, you got to have somewhere to go though. Will we still have indoor dining? Will we still have festivals? Will things still be, you know, will, you know, cause so much, I think what we're learning right now is we take for granted how much dress. And I think of this every time I open my wardrobe, how much of what I wore was actually for someone else, not in a way that, you know, I don't have my own identity, but just, it was to engage with someone or to express something. And when you don't have somewhere to go and express something, you know, it, or, you know, you, you know what so that I think that's going to also determine uh, what we wear um, but I do think um, on the brighter side it could lead to this other pendulum swing of people just really wanting to go for it with what they wear yeah totally amazing stuff I wish we could talk uh, all night but we are almost out of time I want to ask you one last question before I let you go though um, you know aside from the fashion race database uh, which we are all going to go check out and by the way for you at home uh, we will have a link to that in our uh, email that's going to come out to you later along with uh, Nicholas's uh, book um, but you know you mentioned a couple of books uh, through this you know through this conversation and I always love asking this question of, of uh, you know folks who are professors and stuff. But, you know, you and I were talking before this about, you know, the kind of the, the sort of racial reckoning that folks are going through here. Obviously, you have this fashion and race database. You know, uh, what are some what are some things you might suggest, uh, you know, to to us um, that is, you know, a, a book or two that we might seek out or a documentary that we might seek out? Um, you know, that's kind of on this topic of, of kind of fashion that's sort of in your wheelhouse that you're, that you're like, you know, this is a, this is a great read and you're going to learn a bunch from this. Oh gosh, you put me on the spot. Oh, Negrophilia. Negrophilia is a great book. Um, I mean, some of my other books behind me, they're a little kind of textbooky, you know, but yeah, um, very, yeah. I would, Fearing the Black Body behind me is really good um, by Sabrina Strings. Um, Fearing the Black Body actually traces the history of fat phobia. It's a book about especially women's bodies, um, but she discovers this racial component in there um, and that is incredibly fascinating of, of how also the, uh, how um, uh, black women's bodies are demonized as this kind of grotesque um, figure that, you know, really helped kind of, um, set the kind of moral grounding for white women's bodies, slenderness, discipline, staying thin, you don't want to be that, you know, this is the primitive, you know, out of control body. Um, and so uh, that, so Fearing the Black Body by Sabrina Strings was incredibly groundbreaking and fascinating for me, Negrophilia. Um, and I'm also just thinking if there was one other one. I think that, that that's kind of it right now. Um, and oh gosh, there's always a fashion film and I'm going to think of it after our talk now, probably. Okay. but there's always some great documentaries that I, I love to watch. Um, but yeah, those are kind of the, uh, the most critical ones that I like to drop and also cast it does not have to do with fashion, but I just, I really mm -hmm. enjoyed cast that actually greatly influenced, um, my fashion and race course of my grad students this past year. So. Excellent. Kim Jenkins, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, spend some of your time with us this evening. Thank you. This is a pleasure. This is really fun. Thanks. And thank you for hanging with all of us. We really appreciate it. Uh, keep your eyes open on those emails. Like we said, we're going to be sending you links to Kim Jenkins' project, as well as Nicholas Christakis' book. Thank you so much for spending uh, some time with me on your screen, hopefully in your living room. So from my living room to yours, I bid you a very good evening. Thanks for being with us and take care.